So good morning, everyone. Glad to see you on my little clock here. It says that it is 10.15 in Pacific time. So here we are. Glad to see you and welcome to the church in Ocean Park. And I'm going to start off with a, uh, a song that I sang just about a half hour ago with a group of people. They have been singing together since the pandemic, every day at noon. They call it the Daily Antidote of Song. And wow. Yeah. And so it's been like, I think we're on day 1288 something. So I send, sing for them <laughs> sometimes at noon. And uh, this is the one that I did for them. And it's one that's very familiar. So this is one I know that you, that, uh, that you know this, Down by the Riverside. But slowing it down a little bit, thinking about it in some, some different ways. Of course, this song is a historic Negro spiritual, and it was actually sung by black Civil War soldiers who had fought for their own freedom. And then they said, we're going to study war no more. Down by the riverside, I'm going to lay my burden down down by the riverside gonna lay my burden down down by the riverside gonna lay my burden down and study war no Down by the riverside, gonna put on my long white robe, put it on now. Down by the riverside, gonna put on my long white robe. Down by the riverside, gonna put on my long white robe and study war no more. I ain't gonna 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 study war no more. Oh, down by the riverside, we've got to walk in the ways of peace. Walk with me now. Down by the riverside, we've got to walk in the ways of peace. Come on, walk now. Down by the riverside, we've got to walk in the ways of peace. I ain't gonna study war no more. 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 I ain't gonna study war, war no more. I ain't gonna study war no more. Study war no more. I ain't gonna study war no more. I ain't gonna study war no more. I 
ain't gonna study war no more. I ain't gonna study war no more. I ain't gonna study war no more. I ain't gonna study war no more. Welcome to Church in Ocean Park. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Beautiful. I'm at Reverend Janet Gallery McKithen, and I am the minister at the Church in Ocean Park. And you might be wondering if you're welcome here. Well, we're multi-religious, we're interfaith. So you're welcome if you're Hindu, if you're Jewish, if you're Sikh, if you're Muslim, if you're Arab, if you're uh, Wiccan, if you're Jewish, if you're Christian, if you're something else altogether, you're welcome here at the church in Ocean Park. You're welcome if you're married, single, divorced, great gay, transgender, non-binary, or, or, or trying to figure it out. You're welcome if you're fidgety, focused, you just got up or just got out of prison. And we don't care if you're more religious than the Pope or if you haven't been to the mosque since it, it, before the pandemic. We welcome those who are addicted and those who are very uh, in recovery. We welcome you if you're a tennis player, a horseshoe player, a belly dancer, a tree hugger, a latte sipper, a vegan, or a junk food eater. We are well, you're welcome if you're inked, pierced, or both. And we especially welcome you this morning if you're standing in the need of prayer, which many people are. Or if you've been hurt by religion and you're here cautiously, we hope we are a place of love and healing for you. We welcome Arabs, Israelis, Palestinians, refugees, those behind barriers, and those breaking down the walls. We welcome those who are working for peace and those who are praying for peace. We understand in every situation, in every country, there are those who disagree with their governments and there are those who are repelled by extremists, neither of which represent them. We, rep we welcome you no matter where you are this morning. We're a community that can hold it all. We, we don't want you to leave part of yourself at the door and we welcome pe people who are complicated. We're all complicated individuals. And now we take a moment to uh, uh, for a land acknowledgement. Our, in Santa Monica, we sit on stolen land that was taken violently from the Chumash, the Tongva and the Quiche peoples. We acknowledge harms of genocide, forced assimilation, enslavement and destruction at the hands of US colonial settlerism. We also acknowledge that our country and our community was built on the backs of people who were stolen from Africa, placed into bondage and forced into labor, a labor that we benefit from, which has never been repaid. In our acknowledgement, let us commit to healing by working to create a more just and equitable world through changing how we do things that we see as normal, but are asked actually systemically hurting people. Let's take a moment to remember and acknowledge where we are. And we begin with a Thich Nhat Hanh chant. I have arrived, I am home in the here and in the now three times. I have arrived. I am home in the here and in the now. I have arrived. I am home in the here and in the now. I have arrived. I am home in the here and in the now. Welcome to the church in Ocean Park. We're glad you're here. Now, 
for today we do have a short reading and actually a beautiful image came with it so let's see if I can show you that image as well and this comes from the author of the of this reading it's really a prayer is uh, Stephen J. Bins and it is one from Christian tradition and one asking for the prayers of Mary. Mary of Nazareth, who is both Jewish and Palestinian, extend your mantle of mercy over all the peoples of the Holy Land. Jews and Muslims, Christians, Palestinians, Israelis, migrants and refugees. Mother of the Messiah, show us how to be instruments of healing and peace in the midst of war, occupation, terrorism, and divisions. Give us an embracing love for all in the Holy Land, especially for hostages, innocent victims, the homeless, and the dying. Mary, our mother, given to us by Jesus on the cross, pray for us. We are so lucky to have Tahil Sharma back with us. He's our friend and he's a part of the church in Ocean Park. When he came, he's back this morning to talk about silence and neutrality or complicity. He's back on the exact right day. Tahil Sharma is an interfaith activist based in Los Angeles who was born to a Hindu father and a Sikh mother. Following the Oak Creek, Wisconsin shooting of a Sikh temple in 2012, Tahil became involved in efforts for interfaith literacy and social justice, and has been doing this work professionally for the past many years, almost a decade. Tahil serves as one of the three interfaith ministers in residence for the Episcopal Diocese of Los Angeles, and as the Los Angeles coordinator for Sadhana, a coalition of progressive Hindus. Tahil also serves various organizations in different capacities to educate, engage, and serve various communities that promote interfaith cooperation and ethical pluralism and social and productive norms in society, including Interfaith Youth Corps, the Parliament of World Religions, the Giebert Center, and the Interreligious Council of Southern California. Not sure what he does in his spare time. The, Tahil previously worked as the Faith Outreach Manager for Brave New Films, a social justice documentary organization based in Los Angeles that empowers communities and teaches civic participation through new media, facilitation, and strategies for action. He's also a contributing author of books to books including Co-Human Harmony, Using Our Shared Humanity to Bridge Divides, Hindu Approaches to Spiritual Care, chaplaincy and theory and practice and acting on faith stories of courage activism and hope across religions someday maybe we'll have a book reading on his books that i think that would be very interesting welcome back to heal thank you reverend janet uh it's so good to be with you with dr kim with so many others on this call today it's uh it's been a wonderful uh chance to come back to good people to be in good community after an extremely, extremely tough week. Um, I, this space, you know, actually not as positively as I usually do because of just the nature of uh, overlapping conflict and crises um, that we often have to realize we're in. Um, and sometimes we put ourselves in Spaces where we don't want to admit that the world is not in a good place, just so that at least with the steps that we take, we know we can take them comfortably. Um, but in in the next 10, 15 minutes or so, I, I will call upon you to maybe address your discomfort a bit more radically um, as we think about how we navigate this moment Um but I did want to start off with a quick uh, chanting. Um, as uh, some of you may know, uh, today does actually um, begin the celebration of Navratri, uh, which is the nine day celebration or nine night celebration, I should say, of uh, the goddess Durga, 
um, who represents victory, but is also one of the ultimate forms of the feminine divine in the Hindu tradition. Um, this celebration um, is a reminder for um, the Hindu community, but I think for people in across the globe to uh, really reflect on our relationship with femininity, uh, not as a, a typical set of norms that we abide by in a society, uh, but as something that we engage with on the daily that each of us beholds and also each of us contains. Um, what we see in the Hindu tradition as femininity um, are all of the qualities that actually inspire us to be able to engage the world with this transformative nature of love. Uh, but they're never to be seen as passive ideas. Uh, they're actually seen as the most active things you could do. And one of those things itself is power. Uh, power is seen as a feminine energy. Um, that is supposed to fuel all things, that is what makes all things physical. Um, and today I invite you to tap into that energy that each of us has uh, to be able to engage in the good work. So I will begin with my chant um, and then I will, uh, you know, uh, continue with my remarks. <clears throat> if you will, all would like to pray, meditate, reflect as such. Om... Asya Shri Durga Sapta Shloki Mahamantrasya Narayan Rishihi Anushtupa Chandaha Shri Mahakali Mahalakshmi Mahasaraswatyo Devata Shri Jagadamba Pritirthe Pathe Vini Yogaha O Gyani Nama Pichetam Si Devi Bhagavati Hisa Balada Krishya Mohaya Mahamaya Prayachati Durge smrita harasi bhiti mashe shajanto ho. Swaste smrita mati mati vashubham dadasi. Daridre dukha bayaharini katva danya. Servo pakara karanaya sadar da chitta. Serva mangala mangal ye shivi servartha sadike. Sherani trembake gauri nara yanina mustute. Sheranagata dinarta paritana parayani. Sarvasyarthi Hare Devi Nara Yanina Mostute Sarvaswarupi Sarveshi Sarvashakti Samanvite Bhebhyastra Hino Devi Durge Devi Namostute Rogana Shesham Napahansi Tushta Tushta Tukaman Sakalana Pishtan Tamashita Nam Navipanaranam Tamashita Yam Shayatam Prayanti Sarva Badha Prashamanam Trelokya Syakhileshwari Eva meva tvaya karyam asmatvairi vinashanam. Om katyayanaya vidmahe kanyakumari dhimahi. Tanno drge prachodayat. Om shanti 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 hi. May there be peace within us, between us, and all around us. Let it be so. Oh. <clears throat> so I begin with this chant today as I. Um, mentioned earlier, um, as we begin the celebration of the feminine divine within the Hindu tradition. Uh, but it certainly doesn't go unnoticed that I start this celebration as a shakta or someone who follows the feminine divine in Hinduism with a lot of grief, a lot of anger, and a lot of frustration. Um, the past week in you know, working in interfaith spaces for now over a decade, which I just cannot fathom, um, is this idea that um, our engagement in interfaith cooperation <clears throat> is supposed to be a transformative space. It's supposed to be a radically inclusive space. It's supposed to be a courageous space uh, for us to engage in the impossible and achieve the impossible. Um, and I saw that movement of interfaith cooperation fail this week, which is a very challenging thing for me to say. Um, as the um, crisis began looming once again in the Holy Land, um, as we saw the attacks from Hamas onto Israel and the Israeli government returning fire onto Gaza, we started entering a phase of you know, deep disturbance. 
um, we were bearing witness to once again um, a a new a new norm of being so norm of being so used to violence taking place, where within minutes, if not hours, if not days, hundreds of lives were lost, became thousands of lives, hundreds of lives were injured, became thousands. Those same lives also became displaced. They also were robbed of their resources, and they now continue to engage in an uncertain future. For the bare minimum that we could provide here in the context of the United States of creating a multi-religious space to engage in deep mourning, in deep conversation, and in deep solidarity, it was to my surprise that many communities did not consider even making a space available. Many spaces had events that were going on, and they decided to postpone them and cancel them. There were many times where, uh, in communication with leaders and activists and uh, folks that I was close to doing this work, it was the first time that when I tried to call for peace, I was faced with direct animosity from every side possible. And it was an, a strange circumstance for me because people knew of my um, my stance on basically every issue. I always try to make it as clear as possible. But more importantly, I, only sh I don't only show up to talk about these issues. I make it very clear that I stand up for these issues in every way that I can. Yet somehow my ability to just call for peace for those civilians who constantly have to be in a state of fear and violence seem to be the wrong choice of words for a lot of folks who are... Um, unfortunately, very caught up in the emotion of what this is causing for their religious communities, for their ethnic communities, and for those who they know in the Holy Land right now. And this is not to diminish those emotions. This is actually to tap into them and say, if you are here to mourn your own, you have to remember that others have lost too. And this is not a competition of who lost more. If we don't begin to recognize the short-sightedness of the mourning, uh, of a selfish mourning, then we don't realize how collective mourning will actually take us into a better place. And this doesn't actually deny the truth that comes with the history of that region, the history of what the Palestinian struggle has been against uh, against all odds by the Israeli government. There is no truth in denying that decades of oppression have taken place and continue to endure in new ways. Um, we've seen it very clearly that um, the IDF has done everything that it's it, 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 in its power to create pe uh, create traps basically for the Palestinian people where the one the few humanitarian corridors that exist are the ones that you're bombing. You've also created a circumstance where the Israeli government has the power to be able to control resources coming in, even the simplest, most purest things like water. The water that's supposed to sustain all of us is now being restricted for those who live in Gaza. And when you talk about that in the dynamics of a war, typically, you're talking about um, two autonomous powers, two sovereign powers that are engaging with each other in a conflict to see who wins, if there is even a victory at the end of the day. But that is not the equity we're talking about here in terms of a decades-long conflict where there has always been one very clear power and there is one very clear community that has been under control of that power. Um, and when life and death hangs at the balance, we don't know how to engage going forward. And this is why I called my my talk today, you know, um, silence and neutrality are complicity. Um, because many of the folks that I typically engage with in this work have engaged in new forms of silence and neutrality that I don't think I've ever seen before. Um, but I actually do understand where it comes from because I was forced into silence and neutrality in a way. Um by having folks tell me that whatever side I choose to take, 
there's no point in taking a side because I don't understand the issue. Which is very strange for me as someone who has always engaged in nuance. Nuance is such a deep part of why we engage in this work of understanding each other's traditions, understanding each other's communities, and working towards building relationships. And when the core competencies of interfaith cooperation fail in the midst of a deep conflict, we have this, this, this fear strike us, especially as someone who finds this as a professional setting. This is my work. This is my, my bread and butter that somehow is failing me. And it's giving me a crisis of, oh my God, am I even supposed to be working in this space anymore? Is this supposed to be a space for where I actually do what I'm supposed to do to help others for whatever limited capacities that I have? And it made me really think about, I think the the one-on-one -on -one personal element that I think often gets um, overshined in the midst of actually using peace as just an attempt to calm people down rather than as something to be achieved. Um, so I checked in with a lot of my Muslim and Jewish friends. I checked in with a lot of my Palestinian and Israeli colleagues to see how they're feeling. And it is so crazy to me that they are more in consensus when you speak on them, when speak with them one on one, than you do when you talk about it in a public context like social media or in a large gathering. They're all frustrated with the people who are supposed to represent them. Every single one. There's no one that is happy with Hamas or the Israeli government, and it puts me in such a in such a weird situation to be like, wow, you really all are saying the same thing. You all are upset that lives are being lost. You all are upset that the next day may be the fearful moment where you get to hear someone closer to you is gone because of this violence. This violence being so motivated by politics, by resources, by physical land, and by the ability to say that it is our community that takes ownership of it. And that it actually, at its core, has less to do with religion in its general sense, and it has everything to do with the manipulative power of religion. And I spoke to actually NPR about this on Friday morning and said that our ability to be able to make these unique, powerful connections one-on-one -on -one and in the community have failed. When we were supposed to create those, those powerful bonds and use them to make sure that we could help people immediately, everything stopped in its tracks. I knew as an individual I could do a lot more than what my movement was supposed to tell me to do. So I just started, just started doing whatever I can. I started sharing important resources. I started making sure that people knew where demonstrations were happening. I contacted my members of Congress. Um, I did what was in my human power to make sure that if I can help, I will help. Um, I signed petitions to let go of hostages. I'm trying to find places to help um, support humanitarian aid. Um, there's so much that we still can do in the midst of all of this. But what I will not stand for is a silence and neutrality that is so deafening that it makes you immobile from your ability to make a difference. Because we always have the capacity to do that. We shouldn't refrain from this thinking that just because the issue is thousands of miles away, just because we're not a direct stakeholder in the conversation, doesn't mean we're not mutually responsible for a better outcome. Because we are. We share a world. We share responsibility for each other and the resources in it. Um, and it takes a lot of energy to be able to say that we need to be here to make a difference. But there's nothing less than justice and equity that we deserve across the world. Um, we come into this space, you know, really thinking about um, some of the numbers that I've jotted down as of the last several hours of the over 1,300 um, Israelis who are dead, the 3,200 Israelis who are injured, the over now 2,600 uh, Palestinians who are dead, and the almost 10,000 that are injured with now tens of thousands of more who are now displaced, um, who are now trying to find out what is next. And we need to be here in the space today to remember that um, peace is not supposed to be a passive term. 
Peace is supposed to be one of the most active nouns that we engage in on a daily basis. And we unfortunately, I think, lose sight of uh, the power of peace because of how much we use it. We oftentimes create space where talking about peace seems like a very lovey-dovey idea. Uh, it seems like a wonderful thing that we can wake up to in the morning and that we take with us when we go to sleep into our dreams. But unfortunately, the world has not seen a peace that we're talking about before. So that means we can't we can't wish for peace to prevail. We have to make peace prevail. We all have to play a much more active role in making that possible. So I invite you to really think about how this peace is playing a role for you today but really be intentional about how this piece is making sure that it compels you to act towards justice and equity. And I invite you to remember that interfaith cooperation is also one of those active forms of peace. You don't just do it for dialogue. You don't just do it to make friends. You don't just do it to try good new food from around the world. You do it because it's supposed to be a vehicle for something bigger. Interfaith cooperation is not the end goal. Interfaith cooperation is the lens at which you engage the world so that you can achieve justice and equity. And there's nothing less. There's nothing less that you should be doing right now. So to wrap up this space together, I'd like to just um, engage with um, a, a mantra that we chant in Hinduism known as the Shanti part, uh, which is the uh, chanting of, of prayers for peace where we actually ask for peace in all things, um, that which is manifest and not manifest, that which is human and not human, that which is real and not real, um, because we need peace in all of these things. But more importantly, we have to work towards the peace in all of these things. So let us join together in prayer, reflection, and meditation. <laughs> Om Dyo Hushanti Antariksha Shanti, Prithivi Shanti, Apa Shanti, Oshadhaya Shanti, Vanaspataya Shanti, Vishwe Deva Shanti, Brahma Shanti, Sarvatva Shanti, Shanti Reva Shanti, Samang Shanti Redhi, Om Bhadram Karane Bhishunuyama Deva Padram Pashe Maksha Bhiriya Jatraha Stinai Rangai Stushtuvadam Sastanubihi Vyashema Deva Hitam Yadayuhu Sustina Indro Rudhashavaha Sustina Posha Vishwavetaha Sustina Stark Show Arishanemihi Sustina Brahas Patil Dadhatu O Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadhaya Purnameva Vashishate Om Shanti 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 May there be peace within us, among us, and all around us. And may we achieve peace within us, between us, and all around us. May it ever be so. And thank you, Tahil, uh, for the very um, moving and also compelling and motivating talk. And... Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, like to sit with it for a little bit, but we have community sharing time now, and so if there are those of who would like to share, uh, please raise your hand in the um, Zoom way or wave your hand, and you can. We will call on you. How about Craig Ali? Oh, Craig Ali, thank you. Thank you, thank you, also my brother to live. I mean, um, in, in listening to you speak, I am reminded, or your spirit, you know, for me has invoked the spirit of Mahatma Gandhi. And in saying that, he more or less stood fast against an oppressive force and more or less triggered or inspired a movement that was clearly nonviolent, but also very powerful in, in many ways. And I'm wondering specifically if that same spirit exists 
you know, to address that conflict that's going on in what some call the Middle East, you know, to be effective in terms of bringing about something that is beneficial. If not, could you explain why not? Brother Craig, it is very good to see you. Um, as always, a peace. Thank you. <laughs> good to see you too. <laughs> uh, uh, to answer your question, I think there absolutely is. Um, and it doesn't exist in um, a vacuum. I think it exists um, very uh, in a very coexisting way with the powers that be that continue to oppress too. I think in 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 as much as there is this this call for peace from the inside, there is this uh, desire for accountability on the inside. It just really pales in comparison to the oppressive power. And I think what we're seeing, just like what we saw in the context of what happened in the freedom struggle in South Asia, is that we are waiting for the collective power to start building its blocks. Hmm. Um, and unfortunately, a century later of, you know, advancements in technology, and especially in military technology, we know that the potential for loss of life is much higher in the process. Um, so the, the efforts are there and they have been there. And I think it now calls for a, a collective power that builds on community organizing that we know has a lot of power too. Um, we have seen these protests happen in Palestine. We have seen these protests happen in Israel that are saying we want something different. We want democracy. We want a life outside of a norm of violence. And I think it's now going to hit a new point after this conflict where there may be some hopefully positive change. Um, but unfortunately, the that that path looks very bleak right now because of what is what we're engaging in, which is just very deep violence at the political level. Um, and what we have to actually invite ourselves into is mutual a, a, a historic precedent of accountability, which means that those that engaged in violence now need to be held accountable. And whatever led us to this boiling point of violence in the past however many decades of power struggle, of control of resources, of a in, an incessant form of violence also needs to be held to account. And there's no way outside of that if we're really going to have a transformative conversation about a peace-building process in the region. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, Jean Gaska? Thank you so much for this morning. Um, the last I heard, the United States... President Biden said in a speech that we were sending money to Israel. And I didn't hear him say we we're going to help the Palestinian people. And, and the message that that sends hurts me deeply, especially since I am a Jewish person and I can't even bear to walk into my temple because everybody has to stand up and we support Israel. We support Israel. And who's talking about the Palestinian people? So I feel um, I feel frozen. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned writing to your Congress people, and I guess there's the, there's the assumption right away that it's so big I can't do anything. Mm -hmm. But I guess I have to start there, right? I have to say, we have to send money to the Palestinian people. Mm -hmm. Hamas is not the Palestinian people. Hamas mm -hmm. is evil, but the Palestinian people are people. Yeah. So that's Thank all I have to say. Thank you, Jean, for that. I um, it, it, That's exactly right. I We... we the more we withdraw our lens of the humanitarian crisis that this has created, the less we feel that it is necessary to help be positive contributors to it. And, and unfortunately, in, in President Biden and Congress agreeing that money should be sent to Israel, we have unfortunately become complicit and investors by being taxpayers in this conflict. And that is a very tough pill to swallow. Um, it's not one that a lot of people are going to talk about because that is just the withdrawn nature of how we engage in our own democracy. But this is now actually asking us, is democracy the end all be all or do we need something better? Mm. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we'll go to Rachel and then to Linda. 
Um, thank you, Tahil, for your uh, inspiring presentation. Um, one thing that you said that I, you know, as a, as a polytheist, mm -hmm. that I kind of harp on uh, is that the use of religion to manipulate, mm -hmm. and how I usually say that, and pretty much everybody here has heard me say it before. The weaponization of religion, to me, is the textbook definition of evil. And so, you know, and I've been saying since high school, you know, how much blood has to be to be spilled in the sand for these people to understand that we all live together on this planet, mm -hmm. this blue dot, as Carl Sagan said, and that, you know, how, how much blood needs to be spilled in the sand before we realize that peace is the only option for survival of our species. Mm. This is unsustainable. And you know, as far as the current conflict is concerned, the, the killing by either side of civilians is a war crime, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. period. period what Putin's doing to Ukraine, targeting civilians. Mm -hmm. It's wrong. You know, peace comes yeah. from an outstretched hand, not a clenched fist. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, with, with Israel, the Israeli government being the stronger military than, you know, than Hamas or the Palestinian people, you know, to me, it is up to the Israeli government to to present that outstretched hand of love and peace to their fellow human beings, and not this bombardment of a, f a few hundred acres worth of land on the, on the Mediterranean Sea. And so, you know, I I. I'm torn. I, you know, I've I've read stuff, you know, from both sides, from both camps, and I'm torn. Uh, I I don't think either side is 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 acting appropriately, and I I I just think that uh, it's really more incumbent on the Israeli government to put an end to all of this and to start treating Palestinians as human beings. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, we'll go to Linda and then to um, Daria, I think it is. Linda? I think this is, thank you. I, I think I, this is obviously so hard and I really appreciate the the opportunity to be, um, to share space with all of you. Um, I appreciate what Tahil has brought and um, and I'm looking forward to hearing um, what what Daria and Gail and anyone else who who wants to speak has to say. Um, yesterday I was yesterday I was in front of the Israeli consulate on Wilshire, um, with a former student of mine and a comrade of mine. Um, who uh, who did two tours in Iraq? Um, and I figure he has a unique perspective on this. Um, well, maybe not unique, but different from mine. Um, and what he was saying to the people waving Palestinian. He, he said when he walked in there, there were all these Palestinian flags and that he he recoiled in the same way that he would have recoiled if he had walked into a rally filled with Salvadoran flags. He's from El Salvador. And if he had walked into something filled with Salvadoran flags, he would have recoiled because waving a flag 
indicates that uh, <laughs> that you only have really thinking about one side. And what he said that he talked to people there about is that the rulers make the wars and the working people suffer. And, mm-hmm. and that, um, and that an eye for the, anyway, we know that uh, an eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind. And that working people need to, I mean, we're communists, my young friend and I, need to overthrow those rulers and join together. Now that's not a pacifist stance. And I I think we all we would disagree as to what's realistic in this world, whether 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 overthrowing capitalism is more realistic than uh, getting rid of all the weapons that that all the rulers have without taking the power away from them is realistic. Um, whether whether revolution would cause more death than leaving capitalism intact. I think we disagree about those things. But what I do know is that the humanity on both sides is the most important thing that I feel in my heart. Mm-hmm. I also want to say one other thing, which I think... Um, has been missing in this um in this discussion um obviously the neither hamas nor the israeli government have the interests of the masses of the people in that area uh, on their radar but neither one of them is an independent operator um 37 years ago biden gave a speech in the u.s senate where he said It's about time we stopped apologizing for our support for Israel. It's the best $3 billion we spend a year. Mm -hmm. Were there not an Israel, the United States would have to invent an Israel to protect our interests in the region. The United States did invent Israel, turns Mm -hmm. out. Uh, To, to, I mean, they called it uh, our aircraft carrier in the Middle East. Um, The the United States did invent Israel Um, and Hamas is being funded by Iran. And if and this has the potential of a third world war that. Or it may be, I mean, as a historian, I always wonder, like, we always debate what was the beginning of World War Two, right? it wasn't Pearl Harbor, right? Uh, only only American kids think that. Um, maybe it was uh, maybe it was the seizure of Manchuria by Japan in 1930. Maybe it was the Spanish Civil War. Is this the beginning of World War Three? And can is this and can this be the end of capitalism? That's my position. Mm. Thank you, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, we have. Two more that I see, uh, Daria and then Gail. Uh, to heal, it's it's so nice to hear you talk because I feel so at home. Uh, I'm a master's student studying theological studies and interfaith study is one small part of what I study. And as I think about this issue, You know, this week I kind of had a little bit of a crisis within because here I am studying ways in which we can actively live out peace because it's not passive. I agree with you 100%. And we are trying and we are doing everything in our power to increase understanding of another situation. Um, And yet these wars that Linda completely spot on talked about are so interwoven and so interconnected and governments work together to ensure that we have war. They ensure that we have uh, colonization. They ensure that displacement is the goal because they have a war economy that they need to fund. And who are they going to use as their pawn? Well, the masses. 
They're going to create patriotic nationalistic slogans so that people think that when they join the Navy or they join the Army that they are somehow defending their country when really they are contributing to violence over and over. And I don't care where you are from, America has skin in this game. Why? Because we want to colonize. We want to colonize the Philippines. We want to colonize Gaza. We want to colonize everywhere. Because that's our motto, right? You want to make America great again, you're going to go colonize. I am so angry because I am trying so hard to do what I can to contribute to peace, do what I can to contribute to understanding. And we are met with new headlines in our news that tell us that hundreds of thousands of bombs are being dropped on lands. And, oh, well, you know, uh, we should all just try to maybe get along. Well, I'm sorry. I, I can only do so much. And yeah, this week I held a class on nonviolent communication where we talked about Marshall working in Israel and Palestine directly in the middle of this conflict many years ago. It was the most amazing day of my week. But you know, sometimes I wonder, is it enough? Is it ever gonna be enough? Should I give up? Should I just become a capitalist who just lives for myself? Give up on all of this? I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I, I don't want to lose my humanity. But what choice have I? Because I don't know. I mean, I'm in crisis, I guess. I, I'm really worried. But thank you for your talk. I um, Yeah, I better stop talking. Spot on, Daria. <laughs> uh, Gail? Yes, okay. spot on. Um, I'm so glad I tuned in because I was kind of not going to. I just wasn't feeling, I don't know, motivated. But I'm glad I did because I think the reason I didn't want, I didn't know what we're, but I'm so moved by your talk. And it's exactly what, this is a conversation I really have needed. Um, I have been so distressed. That is, isn't the right word, but by what's going on. And um the, my biggest distress is actually about the United States response. Um, you know, the idea of sending more money, sending more weapons to Israel, to me, feels like <laughs> I don't even, the wrong thing to do, to say the least. Um, it's just, and then, and then all the huge, uh, dehumanizing language coming out of at least Israel. I'm I I don't hear anything from from you know the Palestinian people. At least I haven't on the news. But you know they're animals. You know referring to whole groups of people as as animals and not worthy of human compassion and love and you know and i'm just disgusted by our our involvement our as as so many speakers have spoken to already our complicity in this and 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 it's it, as daria said it's not new it's years and years and years and decades anyway it it's helped me to help process some of my feelings listening to everybody um because I haven't heard, I have not heard any of this kind of conversation in the media. Anyway, thank you so very much. I've been inspired. I've been inspired. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gail. Yeah, thank okay. you. I think we'll end with uh, Chaplain Joseph. Good place to end. Yes. Well, I um, hope so. <laughs> I'm not a politician and I'm not a religious um, fanatic. I'm not a, a military person. But this is what I would say. All of this could have been avoided if a different approach would have been taken by the leadership in Israel. Now let me put myself in place of, of, the, of the leader. 
Let us say, I am Netanyahu. Okay, I am Netanyahu now. The first thing I would have done, and I haven't seen any of this at all, the first thing I would have done was to spend about a whole month in trying to comfort my people. I would, have, I would have spent a whole month at least trying to comfort those who were killed, who were um, injured. I would be going around as the leader to visit those people and to um, pray with them, to counsel them, to give them comfort. I would be trying to, yes, I have my iron drone there to, to repel attacks, yes. But I would be trying to, to motivate my, my nation, uh, have a day of mourning, maybe have a week of mourning for my people who were so decimated and, and vilified. I have not seen any of this at all. The first reaction I saw was one of vengeance or, or, or revenge. And I think all of that I'm speaking about have been has, has been missing. While all while I'm doing all of that, comforting my people and reassuring them and being a leader for them, I would probably invite um, a team from the U.S. or somewhere to negotiate to begin the negotiation for um, my people who have been who were taken away. Um, negotiation is going on. I'm comforting my people. I'm being a leader for my people in time of great distress and grief. I have not seen any of that. And I think if I began with that, if I began with that type of attitude and, and leadership, um, a lot of things would not have taken place that have taken place now. That is how I feel about it. Thank you, Chaplain Joseph. Um, thank you all for this time of sharing. And this is the kind of, this is, was an amazing time to begin to process some of this stuff, as well as learn new things. Um, I also, to heal like you, one of the things that I did was reach out to some of my colleagues, some of my rabbis and, and different folks in the different faith traditions and see how they are doing. Um, one of the rabbis I spoke with discussed with me how they felt in competition with the other rabbis, actually, and who could create the best statement. And so they did not put, put we were talking about statements because I, I got a message telling me what kind of statement I should put out. Um, and like, um, there's a lot of different things about, about that with, uh, interfaith leaders. And, um, it's a, I didn't really see it as a competition until this rabbi talked to me that, uh, mentioned that to me. And instead of, um, instead of working on healing and how can we actually be beneficial, sometimes, uh, interface leaders want to like pontificate uh, and uh, it's that isn't I don't see that as as helpful I do see that not being silent is a good idea but I also think that um, just pontificating for pontificate uh, you know just because that's expected is not helpful I don't find um, Anyhow, I did visit with different rabbi friends and colleagues, and I discovered very different reactions, of course. Uh, and um, some of them I expected because I had had a program earlier about 10 or 15 years ago um, where about the Palestinians, and I didn't realize how controversial it was at the time, but I quickly found out by threatening phone calls uh, that I should not have this program. Uh, and so I, I know it's a sticky wicket from the beginning. Um, and people take sides really, really quickly. 
instead of trying to figure out what we can do to help. But I appreciate your being with us, Tahil, and you help us process it and look at various sides. And all of the people who spoke really uh, helped to create more nuance. And that's what um, that the, that's very important. Uh, so thank you all very much. Yes, and th thank you, thank you, Reverend Janet. So we should probably just just take a stretch and just breathe. I found I was looking around for a a setting of that song, and we we have sung it live, but we can't do it the way we would do it live because we're on Zoom. But if you remember the uh, the song from Emma's Revolution from Pat, Pat Humphreys, "Peace, Salam, Shalom," and so. Salam, shalom. 